In Brockton, we swing for the fences so we can touch home. We coach in Brockton to instill the teamwork that builds a great winning tradition. We do business in Brockton because here, you can find a taste of home away from home. We keep our company in Brockton because we love this city. When Brockton is home, everything is within reach. I'm Brockton Mayor Bill Carpenter. Over the past week here in the city of Brockton, our first responders have been training and drilling together in preparation to respond to an active shooter situation. These drills have been taking place at the Goddard School on Main Street with Brockton Fire, Brockton Police, and Brewster Ambulance all working side by side training together. They are implementing a whole new strategy in response to an active shooting situation. Again, recently seeing the events in Thousand Oaks and Pittsburgh reminds us how deadly these situations can be, the potential for casualties, and how critically important it is that we're ready to respond rapidly and effectively. The new strategy here in the city of Brockton will now be focused not just on the first wave of police officers entering the building seeking to uh, isolate and neutralize the active shooter, but immediately behind that first entry, a second entry of teams combined of police and fire side by side to get to the casualties, to stop the bleeding and to safely get them out of harm's way as quickly as possible. This new approach, we believe, will save lives, but it will rely upon teamwork and communication and training, and that's the commitment that we have made. We pray that we will never be faced with one of these active shooter situations here in the city of Brockton, but the residents of the city should rest assured that if this type of event were to ever occur, our first responders, fire, police, and EMS, will be fully trained and ready to respond. In Brockton, we swing for the fences so we can touch home. We coach in Brockton to instill the teamwork that builds a great winning tradition. We do business in Brockton because here, you can find a taste of home away from home. We keep our company in Brockton because we love this city. When Brockton is home, everything is within reach. We are going to update uh, people with respect to the coalitions that are forming with uh, other communities in the state and uh, the events that occurred in Holyoke uh, with respect to bringing uh, several cities and towns together who are in a like uh, position as Brockton. And we're also going to have an update from uh, our public officials in terms of uh, where we are at, where we have been, and uh, what's uh, going on with this issue and, and uh, what uh, we need to do in the future to um, uh, be effective, be effective advocates on behalf of the city and the, the children of Brockton. So uh, with no further ado, I will introduce uh, Mayor Carpenter. Welcome, Mayor. Well, good evening, Mr. Chair, Superintendent, members of the school committee. Um, First of all, I want to uh, thank the Finance Committee for holding this meeting. I think it's important uh, that both uh, the superintendent, myself, and other elected officials have an opportunity to both update the school committee, but also update the public uh, as to exactly where we're at on school financing here in the city of Brockton and how we got to where we are today and, and where we intend to go from here. Uh, the underfunding of public school systems in gateway cities like Brockton is not new. Uh, we have been looking 
Sully, did you have that okay? Or? Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, we have been fighting this fight and working on this for several years. And I think what we're seeing is it's, this is not about one year school budget. This is about the compounding continuing effect of year after year after year of being underfunded. And some critical areas of the school budget uh, have taken hits in order that the, so that the budget would allow us to fund the things that were required by law to fund. I know the superintendent will spend some time talking about the impacts on her budget as she tries to put the school budget together. Uh, there have been a lot of questions about, well, why doesn't the city just put more money into the school budget? Well, we just instead of putting in 20%, put in 25% and that will solve the problem. And if the city had the ability financially to put in the 25%, we'd already be doing it. But the Chapter 70 formula is not that s simple. Uh, and really, I think hopefully with the presentation I have for you, it'll make it clear that our problem is at the state level. It's the underfunding of the state's commitment to fund public education. So uh, I'll, I'll open by saying that, you know, the public schools in the city of Brockton are being badly hurt because the state funding formula is just inadequate. The legislature's own commission indicated that the Chapter 70 formula does not adequately address the cost of inflation, special education students, low-income students, or English language learners. And the rate of increase in the cost of health insurance and salaries over the past 25 years well exceeds the overall inflation cost index used. Not only are they underfunding on special ed students, low-income students, and English language learners, but they've also used artificially low inflation rates that have not allowed, allowed any school system like Brockton to keep up with increases in the cost of running the schools. The cost assigned to educating low-income English language learners and special ed students especially lags true cost, particularly harming urban school districts like the city of Brockton. And to make things worse, the state made a major change in fiscal year 17 in the calculation of the amount of aid for low-income students, penalizing Brockton about $6 million. Before that change, students that were eligible for free reduced lunch programs were counted as low-income. After the change, only students who were enrolled in a state-administered program such as SNAP or MassHealth would be considered economically disadvantaged. This is a much more stringent definition and it greatly reduced the number of students who would be classified as low income. In Brockton, about 4,000 students fell through the cracks in the change of definition. The reality is that all of those students are still in our school system and they are still low income or economically disadvantaged. If you take a look at the first exhibit here, you can see that from FY16 to FY19, while the city's enrollment was essentially stable at about 17,700 to 17,800 students, the city's Chapter 70 aid only increased by about $2.8 million, or 1.7% in total. It's a 1.7% increase over four years, while inflation at just 2.5% per year would have yielded an increase of over $13 million. That is a gap in revenue for funding real cost increases of over $10 million in those years, just on the inflation adjustment alone versus what the real increases were, created a $10 million gap. The state's funding mechanics for the cost of charter school students makes the problem even worse. In the period of FY16 to FY19, because of charter school losses, net Chapter 70 aid to Brockton has actually decreased from 165.4 million to 159.8. No, no, no. Um, if you look at that chart up there right now, the red line coming down is the net Chapter 70 after the adjustment or the deduction for charter schools. So that you can see 
that we're actually receiving less money over the past four years after the charter school deduction, even though our student enrollment has been pretty steady, has not decreased. The state sends the Chapter 70 aid for charter schools directly to those schools. The city never sees that money. <coughs> the amount of money that the state sends is based on average per pupil funding costs. These averages include the cost of ELS, low income, and special education students. However, not many students from these categories actually end up as permanent attendees of those charter schools. That means the charters are receiving money for student populations that they aren't really educating. And this penalizes the students remaining behind in BPS. I think you'll see when the superintendent makes her presentation, uh, you know, are among those being penalized the most in the Brockton schools are general education students. In addition, while some costs may be avoided for every student who leaves a Brockton school to attend a charter, the average cost cannot be. Most of the costs still remain, buildings, staff, materials, etc. It takes a lot of transfers before the average cost can actually be reduced, and the reality is that students leave from all over the district, not just one school. That makes consolidating very disruptive. And then to make matters even worse, the state fails to fully fund its own method to assist communities with the impact of charter schools. The reimbursement formula calls for 100% reimbursement in the first year and then 25% each year in subsequent years. But the state does not fully fund those latter years. In fact, right now, they're not funding them at all. This failure costs the city millions per year. And last year, as you can see on this graph, the charter school deduction from our Chapter 70 aid was over $15 million. And the reason you see that spike up in the last three years, several factors, but the, prim the primary factor is the opening of the New Heights Charter School in Brockton. This loss of revenue that we're talking about with the unreimbursed charter school deductions and unfair methodology in calculating the charter school deductions is in the millions of dollars per year, and these losses are over and above the lost income from the change in calculation of the, of the low income students. So the conclusion is that unless the state renews its commitment to providing an adequate level of funding to the state school districts, especially urban school districts, then Brockton will not have the revenues necessary to provide funding to its schools. Now this graph shows our city's own revenues versus unavoidable costs. So the baseline at the bottom is our uh, fixed costs and, and unavoidable costs. Uh, examples of those would be pensions, health insurance, debt payments, tuition to Southeastern Regional VOTEC, and other charges. Those are costs that have to be paid that are unavoidable. The red line at the top illustrates the total revenue into the city for the year. And the green line in the middle is the unavoidable costs plus our local contribution to the school system. So you can see that this year, between the unavoidable costs and the money that we sent in net school spending, direct aid to, to Brockton's classrooms, uh, totals $143 million out of a total revenue of $185. That leaves $42 million remaining to cover all the other expenses of city government. And I think what this really shows is that the fixed costs, the city's fixed costs and our own obligations, which is the total of the green line, consume most of our, re of our revenue base. And this makes it extremely difficult for this to compensate with city funds for the state's failure to properly fund the public schools. Okay. However, from fiscal 2014 through the current fiscal year, we will have given our schools nearly $10 million above and beyond the legal requirement of the foundation formula. 
and in particular notice in those past two years, seven million of that $10 million is over the last two years. For fiscal year 19, we will exceed, we will contribute from the city budget to the school budget in excess of the Chapter 70 Foundation requirement, $2.7 million over and above what we're required to send. We are sending as much as we possibly can from the city's resources to try to make up some of the gap that is created by the state's underfunding. So let's see where that money comes from. This first pie chart shows you where we spent all of the money that came into the city budget. Those are the general fund appropriations. Where did that revenue go? Well, you can see that nearly half of the general fund appropriations, nearly half of the city's revenues, go directly to the school budget. So almost half of all total revenue goes directly to the schools. Now look where some of the other categories are where our other resources are going. Insurance and benefits, we're required to pay those. Pensions, we're required by law to make those pension contributions every year. Um, maintenance, it's only 4% of the total. The only real, as you look at that pie chart, the only place within our appropriated budget to look for an amount of money that would be significant enough to make a difference in terms of the underfunding of the schools is the 19% which is for um, looking for the exact phrase city personal services payroll city payroll city personal services and overtime is 19% of the budget that's the only place in that entire chart where you could see any ability to try to find any additional funding for the schools so let's focus in on that 19% for city personal services and overtime. Here's how that city personal services and overtime breaks out. This is how our city payroll breaks out. Over three quarters of it goes to public safety, police and fire. 76% of our city personal services and overtime goes to police and fire. Only 5% to DPW and about 19% covers everyone else that works for the city, all other city departments. So this is the only part of the budget to look at, and three quarters of it is public safety. I, in almost five years as mayor now, have never had anyone stop me on the seat, street and tell me to spend less money on police and fire. Quite the opposite is true. We're trying to, to keep those departments fully staffed and to protect the city and the people who live here. So I think what this shows you is that in terms of the city's ability, our ability to increase our local contribution to the schools, there's, one of, there's only one of two ways to do it. The first one would be to cut public safety. I'm not willing to do that, nor do I think the vast majority of, of our constituents here in the city want us to do that. The only other way to find additional money for the schools is to increase revenues. So to increase the revenues coming into the city, that means either raising taxes through a debt exclusion or a Prop 2.5 override, or creating new additional streams or sources of revenue coming into the city. I'm opposed to a Prop 2.5 override or a debt exclusion that's just raising taxes over and above the tax increases that are necessary each year to keep city government running. And the reality is that most Brockton homeowners are struggling to pay their tax bill right now. And our homeowners and our business owners are already paying their fair share. We can look to additional sources of revenue and there may be a couple of opportunities on the horizon. One would be supporting the permitting and licensing of up to eight adult use recreational marijuana businesses in the city. And that's in front of the city council right now. The state law has been passed. The regulations have been set. The Cannabis Control Commission has been established. And I've said, as I've said publicly before, 
I do believe there's an opportunity to do this thoughtfully and carefully so that we minimize the impacts on the city while maximizing revenue, generating much needed millions of dollars of revenue, new revenue, into the city. And that new revenue would come partly in the form of host community agreements and partly directly from the 3% local tax that's included in the state's sales tax on marijuana. And I have pledged publicly, and I'll state so on, again on the record today, that out of the tax revenues generated by marijuana that would go into the city's general fund, I would appropriate, subject to the city council's approval, 60% of those revenues to the school budget. So for every dollar that comes in in tax on marijuana, I would commit to submitting a budget that appropriated 60 cents of that dollar to the school budget. There has been also in the past a proposal for a destination resort casino in the city. And while that's not actively under consideration, if that opportunity were to arise again, the projected revenue to the city was 10 to $12 million per year. And I would make the same commitment to commit 60% of those funds to the school budget over and above our required foundation contribution. So to wrap up, I think it's clear, looking at what we just took a look at, that the underfunding of our public schools is at the state level. And that means the fix has to come at the state level. We are working closely with our legislative delegation to pass meaningful Chapter 70 reforms, changes to the formula that would more adequately reimburse our school system's costs for low-income students, special education students, and English language learners. But at the same time, we are working towards the filing of an equity and education lawsuit, because I firmly believe that not only is the current Chapter 70 funding formula unfair, it's unconstitutional. The Supreme Court has decided this before, back in the early 90s. A ch the quality of a child's public education in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts cannot be dependent upon his parents or her parents' zip code. A child's, the quality or the e equality of a public school education in any community in this city, in any community in this state, in the Commonwealth, cannot be tied to that local community's ability to raise property taxes. That's already been decided and it may be necessary to reassert that again in the courts. My hope would be that with the filing of an equity and education lawsuit, with wide, widespread support by a coalition of communities from across the state, uh, that that would create an environment in which both the administration and the legislature could find a way to make the types of changes necessary to the Chapter 70 formula that would allow us to restore the cuts that have been made in our school budget over the past few years. So that concludes my comments, but I'll be happy to take any questions from the school committee. Mr. Chair? Casino could possibly bring in 10 to 12 million a year if, in fact, it ever got off the ground in Brockton. What would, are your estimated projections with regard to the marijuana uh, industry? If yes, so first, in terms of the casino, that number was based upon when there was a prior proposal. Uh, we had negotiated a host community agreement that guaranteed a $10 million minimum payment each year to the city. Uh, and in addition to that, that $10 million did not include uh, hotel room taxes on the resort hotel that would be built, nor did it include revenue from water and sewer sales. So the, the 10 to $12 million is a minimum that would have come. Projecting the revenue from marijuana is a, is a, is a little less scientific because we're, we're, we're sailing into uncharted waters. But we do know what the formula says. 
Uh, it says that the state regulations provide <coughs> that the local community can, can receive 3% uh, of all marijuana revenues in the form of a host community agreement and can receive an additional 3% in sales tax on retail adult use recreational sales. We have done some pro formas to try to project what we think that looks like. We think that you would see a, a building number each year over probably a five year period as this new industry and new business would get built out in the state. It's gonna be generating a lot more in year three, four, and five than it would in the first year as businesses are just getting open. But we have done a pro forma. We have an existing medical dispensary in the city right now in good health that's been in business for three years. And under the state regulations and the state law, they are going to be permitted to um, go into the recreational marijuana sales and all lines of business that they're already in for, for medical. So that's cultivation, manufacturing, and <coughs> retail sales. Looking at just in good health, and they would be the one that's already up and running, and also in multiple lines of the marijuana business, both cultivating and producing and selling retail. Um, we're projecting that in their first full year, they would pay about a million dollars to the city, and by year five, they would be paying about $2.5 million to the city. They would tend to be one of the larger ones. So depending how you want to base your estimates, I think that a realistic projection of, of what marijuana revenue could be to the city is between six and ten million dollars per year, every year. And I know, having worked on, I count real quickly how many, I think it's nine school budgets now, uh, between my time on the school committee and my, my time as mayor, <coughs> I know what several million dollars would mean to the Brockton Public Schools in terms of getting our children the technology they deserve, uh, to getting class sizes back down to where they should be, to restoring about 200 positions in our system that have been lost over the last three years, um, I know that that revenue would be critical. And that's why I look at both of those issues as the CEO of the city, knowing that we desperately need the additional revenue and what the impacts would have. And uh, I am pledged to appropriating, and again, I've got to say, subject to the council <coughs> approval, I submit the budget, but it's subject to council approval, but I would request appropriations of 60% of that new revenue to the school budget, over and above our foundation requirement. 